everyone was uh, uh, pushing for an alternate way of existing and life and in their own personhoods, in society, in uh, the midst of unjust power, uh, in the different kinds of ways that people would define it differently depending on where their allegiances were and there were factions and subgroups. Uh, and where I live, which is in San Francisco in this period of the mid-1970s, uh, this is sort of like a kind of underground world. It's this world of denizens that's not interested in and contributing in an immediate sense to the above ground life for the most part, just on the edges in that sense, those on the edges. But in its own world or its own interests are, it's like full time. It's very busy, it's like all the time. It's hard, so it's hard to describe, but I'm all the time in this other kind of way now. I'm getting more, so I could have gone the Don Clark way, so I'm describing to you when I got my master's degree in 1975. So what happened to me between my master's degree in 1975 and April, and then when I'm writing this stuff here, and I'm, I'm writing, I'm becoming gay shameless in 1977. It's hardly more than a year or a year and a half, two years and a half, huh? Two years and a half. It's not a long time, literalistically. Uh, and it's coming out at first in this way that's very exotic. I think the way to describe it. Like with, with me looking back on it now, I just thought it was very exotic to call it shame on it, to call it shame on to call it becoming gay shamanism is an exoticism. And, and, and there's a form of imperialism in it, okay, to, to have a title like that. That's, there's an implicit imperialistic using of, of native ways of being by being interested, not, just in, not, not so much in the use of the words themselves and the title, but it's all referencing. Am I being shamanic? Am I being a shaman? So I am part Cherokee. So that there's a part of my blood which can actually go back to that world where people actually lived like that, were that way. But it's a less, a small, actually, percentage of me. And it was back at that time, it was the thing to do, just like that, in, in, not only to be non-white, if, if, if someone was mainly white, but not exclusively, to be as much as you could lessen the whiteness. And I describe this. How it was at the time, looking back, <coughs> if I was to describe it to you now, okay? So, and also then if you were male, the lesson of the maleness. And if, then the female parts to maximize the femaleness. And, you know, and we were, anyone who was male was called male or thought of themselves as male was automatically, in the world I was in, extremely highly fem, would be called feminist, at least. And there were more, much more extreme groups, of course, of gay men, some of them from Oakland, and then the years earlier than the gay men's club from Berkeley, called the e feminists, where this extreme, uh, uh, mainly but not exclusively gay men, uh, extremely renouncing of masculineness and maleness and, and in favor of feminineness for themselves and for culture, and all interested in righting a wrong or rebalancing a terrible index towards the masculine or patriarchal traditions of the overriding uh, predominant culture and against patriarchy, well, which is wonderful stuff in its own terms. So I'm trying to describe to you the, the meta use of that understanding. And it was like just in the air, it was like everywhere to be like this. So when I first was interested in becoming, then what would it mean to be okay as gay? And then it wanted me to be uh, something that was about the uh, meaning and beginning and ending of the cosmos, to be gay. To be gay was to be nothing and everything. There was no need to go anywhere else. So I could point to other identities I have and other traditions I have as well. I have a variety of them. I've cultivated a further variety of other kinds of activities and interests in life. So uh, there are many kinds of things we do that all the time. It's what might be provocative in interesting ways and deepening ways and uh, unexpectedly alchemical ways, most particularly. That then becomes most curiously interesting. I had no idea that this could be by being pro-homo, by following the star of homo-ness, homo-ness itself. Not the forms of it, not even like, uh, oh, so I would see someone hot or something, so I get hot, you know, so I feel the hot feeling, but rather, where's that coming from? 
in me, and I don't mean some, some physiological hormone, and I don't mean some sociological force. I mean the moment of my feeling, the feeling, no matter what the content of the feeling is. I denounce my own organism, but I cannot feel my own moment of being in the feeling of the feeling, in the actuality of the feeling, in the moment of feeling. I only actually exist in the moment of feeling, no matter ideas or not ideas of anything or nothing, or what culture or not culture, or any culture or no culture, or all cultures or few cultures. So, I had to discover this for myself, this, this kind of this moment of being, but not leaving out that it was also being gay. And from, the, from a non-pro-gay viewpoint, that would look awfully tilted towards being gay. But not if you're, from a gay point of view, it's not. At all. So, I thought it would be interesting to get a little more into this to, to show you how strong it was back then. And, and, and connected to a kind of passion that uh, uh, I don't think much, much of us have a, very much access to. I certainly feel like an old person now, uh, compared to uh, 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 how I might have been back then. When I first began to imagine that being gay could mean this kind of stuff, this kind of way of being, and only by being authentic to myself was this possible. And it taught me the, uh, the potential of authenticness in, in me taught me. <coughs> Not the other way around. So I don't want to describe something where uh, my ego willed it or uh, it was about uh, my defensive wishes fulfilling themselves as they supported my way of understanding things. It didn't, you know, was not experienced by me like that. It was experienced by me in a different kind of way, like I was a student, or I was, I was, I was in the position of, of learning. And I still feel that way about stuff. Yeah, it is. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, I'll read you a little bit in the introduction so you get the feeling of how it is, how it was back then. Uh, in this kind of community, if you if you wanted to speak in the world I lived in at that time, uh, you just spoke up, you did something. You put on a show, you made a movie, you wrote a poem, you then might have uh, <coughs> gone to a place where you could stand up and show your poem, or you might have belonged to a, 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 a commune. I lived in a commune. Everyone mostly lived in communes and collectives. The sissies, for example, there were the faggots. And these were not artificial, not thought of at the time as artificial notions. Um, people thought of themselves as individuals and, and applied the terms as tools in their own use of, of who they were as persons and also towards each other and, and towards, I don't know, the outsider general world or the public. So, I was kind of more or less interested in that, addressing that kind of world. This is the introduction of this book. Uh, this book, by the way, is from 1980. It's, so the introduction that I'm reading to you is a little later than the actual essay I'll get into. When the essay, Visionary Love, first appeared in the winter 1976-77 issue of Gay Sunshine, I had little idea that it would affect some gay men as deeply as it has or that it would take on a living, independent, underground existence. Keep in mind, this is an essay uh, about the uh, virtue of uh, homosexual archetypality. Archetypalness, but homosexual. It's so, that was the essay. That's the first essay. It says very strange stuff, even now, you know, it's decades later. I had little idea that it would affect some gay men as deeply as it has, and that's what it did. I got these odd reactions, letters in the mail and things, from guys after it, the essay was, was printed in this magazine they had, uh, Gay Sunshine. It was the cover article at the beginning of 1977. 
so it was in the beginning of 1977, they ran it. There's a little idea that it would affect some gain in as deeply as it has, or that it would take on a living, independent, underground existence. But when I started receiving long, enthusiastic letters, long-distance phone calls, and even requests for visits from total strangers, I could hear a strong chord vibrating. Their responses were intense, personal, caring, often tinged with feelings of creative inspiration, as if the essay had reached down below their minds, and stirred up pools of inspiriting juices. And brothers told me they felt supported, strengthened, encouraged, turned on. The essay seemed to have a healing effect. It felt as if I had touched my readers, and some then had touched me. In the months and years that followed, I discovered that the essay was traveling from hand to hand, by word of mouth, around the country and even overseas. Long after that issue of Gay Sunshine, I would hear from somebody new in Colorado or San Diego. These responses felt very good to me. They fed my heart space, renewed my commitment to my gay brothers and our visions. I don't think I would have been able to continue without these exchanges of loving, empathic care. I am convinced that my and our gay visioning and unfolding would be impossible without nurturing emotional supportive sharings like these. The lack of supportive friendships, networks, matrices, and communities has been one of our worst weaknesses, severely hobbling our efforts toward gay freedom and self-maturity. Anybody who feels they're gay, who wants to be themselves and unfold their gayness, is a hell of a time with little encouragement and much resistance, even active hostility within our so-called gay community, not to mention straight society, the wandering seeker easily becomes a day's wanderer, depressed, discouraged, diffused, cynical. Without positive gay affiliations, associations, affections, we have only straight cultural values, standards, and means to go by. And these are all deadly for gay selves and gay questing. I feel this deeply. I've seen too much death, both psychic and physical, to feel otherwise. To me, this is not an intellectual, even a rational issue, but one felt in the heart. It is not a question of belief, but a direct experience of knowing. I know there exists again as something severed from an alien to strayed modes of being. I know that the, this gayness excites incredulity, opposition, fear, anger, hate, and violence. But I also know that gayness, this gayness inspires strength, love, and profound visions in those who are of it. I can feel these visions in my heart. Their fierce innocence shatters my unfeeling sleep. My zombie existence in the land of mind games defenses no thoughts. These visions are underminers termites in the house of my, quote, personality, end quote, my cultured, cultured ego self. They are so vital, direct, immediate, pleasurable, whole, healing, spiritual, that they simply bypass my thinking. They bypass my resistances and censors. They are wild freedom ones in my blood. They push out on the sores and scabs of my life in this noxious, obnoxious civilization around me. I look into my heart, and I hear messages from beyond, beyond that phony who I thought I was, beyond straight society, beyond Western culture, beyond time and space. I see an ancient, wise being in myself. I see rainbows between worlds. I see our Earth as a thinking, breathing, unitary entity. I see the spreading cancer of mankind over its face. I see new forms of evolving conscious beings, new forms of possible society, culture, reality. I feel the strong presence of a great wheel turning, the wheel of death and rebirth. I see visions of the life sources changing, so that whatever is not of this changing, but is old and prior to it, will be cut off, will run out of life and drop into extinction. I see gayness as very much a part of caused by, leading into, and through this changing. I see gayness as a door, a source, a spirit, a lover, a teacher, or rather as source.
rejoicing and spiriting, loving, teaching. It spirits me away somewhere. Magical, strange, profound. I mean teaching weirdnesses, opening, expanding, dropping me into lights. I feel ecstasy, wonder, delight. I feel spirit. 